I came to Caltech during my first year of my graduate studies, and I saw people looking at diversity at the single cell level, and they were using bacteria at the time, and they had toothpicks. And they were picking tens of thousands of colonies off these plates with toothpicks and putting them into wells. And this is how they were physically isolating individual bacteria to look at different enzymatic expression levels, say. And I looked at that, you know, and I was going, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I came across uh, Stephen Quake's lab at Caltech, and they were doing uh, microfluidic devices, very simple ones at the time. They were doing um, uh, T-channels, and they'd etch them into um, uh, a silicon surface or a glass surface, and they were using them for sizing DNA. So I guess that was probably the turning point where I said, well, maybe I can take these small systems where you're moving small pieces of fluid around and use them to manipulate single cells or single proteins. So this is what the lab has gradually grown to on building very large complex chips with um, thousands of chambers in which each one can hold a single cell. But the process along the way was, was non-intuitive, so there was a lot of stops and starts along the way. We make these small elastomeric microfluidic chips in the lab, and the way we go about doing this is actually a bit like making a cake. You make the chips in layers. So typically for a two-layer device, we have molds on silicon wafers patterned with microchannels. It's very similar to the process used to pattern electronic circuits. These patterns essentially are the active conduits for flowing liquid through the chips. And during the assembly, you align these channels on top of each other. And in between the channels, there's a thin layer of silicone. And where the channels cross over each other, these areas become valves. So just like electronic switches, these little thin layers of rubber are mechanical switches for gating fluid and moving things around. In order to communicate with the chip, what we do is we actually use pneumatic pressure and we actually hook these up through the very small tubing out of the top of the chip and the gating of the air inside these devices is clicking open and shut these valves inside the devices those are actively controlled by the solenoid valves which are run by a LabVIEW computer program from a biological perspective I think that the central goal of the chips is really to explore the diversity in biological and chemical systems so in some sense you're saying I've got a million different cells and I know they're doing something slightly different so how do we look at the cells individually so how do we take each cell put it in its own small environment and take a snapshot of it of what it's doing on its day-to-day -day life or in, in an artificial surrounding one of the applications for the chip is for foodborne illnesses and the way you can conceive of actually looking at foodborne illnesses is to take a drop of say the contaminated suspected food and load this thing in the chip and look for bacteria or viruses that you suspect of causing this type of uh, infection. I think realistically we can have these things ready in five years and that the infrastructure from the chips has been well developed and is being defined by several laboratories across the country every day so we're certainly learning a lot on how to manipulate fluids and also there is a big interest from the MEMS community on making integrated sensors and detectors for these type of chips.